Hello everybody, welcome back to Sessions, the podcast about the people who work in the esports and gaming industry and how they survive. My name is Matt Demers, I'm your host. This week we are going to be talking to Julian Zhu, who is a Smash community leader and current employee of Smash GG, um, a tournament platform that the Smash Brothers community uses to organize all their tournaments and fundraising. It's actually kind of an interesting story. He started off as a competitor and then kind of moved into meme territory and is now living the dream, so to speak. We're going to talk about all that kind of stuff as well as balancing um, being a competitor with just trying out new things in media and content production and just, you know, kind of shoot the shit a little bit. Uh, This is going to be episode 7. It's recorded on July 11th. It's going to be out on July the 14th. Thank you again for following along with this podcast. Sessions is about the humans, not the handles. Zoo, tell me how you're doing today. Dude, I'm doing pretty well. Um, you know, had a long week, of course, but uh, had some free time, and uh, here we are. So let's do this. Exactly. I was talking <laughs> to Tafikins last week about this, and we are T minus a couple days from Evo. How are you feeling about that? Oh, man, is it the I, most wonderful time of the year? It's um, it 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 is. Uh, well, hmm. so it I, I just have isn't. to be honest, because like I I've gone to a couple Evos, I've gone to so many events, and you know, Evo to me is like. I think I think gonna be really really good because I get to to hang out with all my friends and you know see the family um, at a competitor level or just like as a competitor experience. Um, it's still really up there, but uh, you know we've done it a few times, so it's it's still really good. But it's not it's not the first time, you know. That's actually an interesting thing I didn't think about until I was like about to ask you a follow-up question but smash gg isn't actually running evo they do all their stuff uh in-house which is kind of interesting for you in the sense that you're going you're going to be uh obviously kind of as an ambassador a little bit there but at the same time you don't have the pressure of like being everyone's go-to like oh no something's on fire with the website um yeah i mean usually for these events um especially in smash events like we were there for ceo but we didn't really like help with the like Smash GG side of it. Mm. Ideally, um, you know, we work with the TOs and get everything sorted out before the event. Um, so it, it's not typical for us to go to an event and actually like be needed, so to speak. So as a competitor um, and just as a fan, usually the Smash GG crew just goes and just just has a good time, uh, you know, enjoy the event. So. Yeah, you. That actually makes a really good point. Pretty much, I was. Um, I remember Pound Five, where you guys essentially just had like a desk, and it wasn't. It was more of a. Mer- it was more for selling the merch and the hoodies and stuff than it was actually like, um, doing, like any kind of logistical work or being on hand if there's any any problems. But the interesting thing, I think I've talked to one of the people behind the Smash GG like thing colloquially on Twitter before, and they were kind of like, it's a platform. It's not just like we we don't we don't do all the tournament running we just provide tos a place to do it and i guess i just wanted to ask like before even before you were hired like did you see the value in this kind of platform like it seems like smash has really taken to it oh man um well before i was hired uh so smash gg like i kind of just saw it as a place where like you know i I go to sign up for events and like i look at the bracket and stuff but i i don't think i really understood what smash gg really did for for the community because i never looked too close at it but um, I think one comparison that I like to use is that I think Smash GG is similar to Twitch, where like if we look at Twitch, um, Twitch has provided a platform for people to kind of uh, like either teach gaming or enjoy gaming or just like share a gaming experience with other people um, to the point where people actually have like a, a career or, you know, some sort of like way to make a living off of it, right? Um, I think Smash GG is more than just a platform for running events at this point. It's, it's a way for um, like TOs and events to, to stay sustainable. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not something that I really realized until um, I started working there and also because of your article. <laughs> yeah, for the, for the people who haven't read, basically I just wrote like an article a couple weeks ago about just like the importance of it as a uh, like to the community, mostly just because for me, I've I've seen a lot of platforms kind of come and go in terms of their usefulness and the only problem is or the main problem is, is that you can never get everyone to use it. For every tournament platform there is or every social network even, there're going to be people who don't want to use it and that means you're either going to have to have multiple accounts which no one likes or you're going to have this one oddball tournament that doesn't use it and then everyone's going to complain that they don't use it and that kind of stuff so to have everyone kind of under the same roof except for some major 
um, you know, some outliers, let's put it that way, is actually kind of a miracle, let's put it that way. And I think um, just the utility that it brings in terms of combining like the challenge bracket and tournament running stuff with just like you ut- um, having, you know, the fantasy and having like the utility of having just like one account to be able to sign up for everything was just like it. It seems like basic social networking 101, but in terms of getting it working and making the community accept it, that's just like, that was the remarkable part. It wasn't so much the, the how the site was built. It's just that the community accepted it. It's a you know, like a crucial part of it. And like, that's that's the, the amazing thing. Yeah, I think it was a combination of a lot of the above. I mean, like before Smash GG was as big as it was, like everyone was using Challenge um, or like a mix of that and TO. Uh, but I, I guess, like what you said, um, the the main issue with um, like everyone using the same platform is that not everything was consolidated into one single thing, right? Like um, you would have like Smashboards accounts, and you would have like you know different bracketing system, and you have like different places to to have your tournament information. But I think Smash GG was one of the first platforms that attempted to put it all together, and I think um, the fact that they they went that far and did a good enough job where where people would actually use it. Um, you know, put it as kind of like the, the market leader, so to speak, currently. So I, I think that's that's the reason why. And I think a lot of that was also very intentional. Um, Sean and a lot of the people who, who work at Smash EG and who kind of brainstormed all the ideas to put together a good platform that the, the community needed, um, I think thought a lot of these things through. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, recognize the, the, the needs of the community and, um, you know, went from there. I mean, that's that's the thing is like you obviously want to develop something that you yourself would want to use. And I think that's a really good cornerstone of just like making or creating anything these days. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, kind of the, the story with that whole thing is that like with with Smash GG, like all the the people like Sean, uh, who's like the, the owner and like a lot of the developers and and everyone who's part of the original team, um, they're all big Smash fans. And you know they they know about the tournaments um they've they've been to them and they understand like the logistics and they see like the needs of the community and i mean they're they're part of the community and i think that's the reason why smash gg has done well it's because you know it was it was built by developers and leaders that are part of the community who understand and, the problems yeah something i noticed is that like they have a prime opportunity to work with the the tos that like normally if normally would be hamstrung like i'm thinking about the challenge platform and like if anyone from challenge is listening i'm sorry i don't want to seem like i'm shitting all over your platform it's more of just like imagine you're a to and imagine you're trying to run a tournament like big house which is like a, a, a national i guess regional or something like that you're looking at like 500 entrants you know multiple events that kind of thing you're easily like over a thousand people or a thousand different entrants in different events and something goes wrong or there's that small little thing that you don't that you think could run it better and you might think that other TOs might enjoy it as well you're it's going to be significantly harder or at least it looks like it from the outside to approach the challenge people who are looking to be as utilitarian as possible and to be as many things to as many different people as possible where smash gg at least before it started branching out into other fighting games they're just like all right we're singular focused we've got smash on the brain We're going to take as many suggestions as we can from the community in order to make this all run smoothly. And then because we're doing that, we have the adoption rate that will keep us actually growing. Yeah, um, that that's that's exactly the strategy, I think, Um, with with Smash EG, it was definitely like a focus on a single vertical, which was Smash. Just, you know, I mean, there are tons of uh, the grassroots, just like small and large events for Smash. So like. I think Smash GG focused on Smash first to, to get the platform like really solid for Smash um, and then expand from there. Um, I think a, a big part of what you said was like, uh, so Smash GG, we, we basically work with every TO and every account, so to speak, uh, pretty closely. Um, so we work with them from like basically the, the, the start of their event to after their event and we take all of the suggestions and, and all of that stuff. So there's like constant communication. Um, and I think that's a, a big reason why you know, all these like little features that you you might not think of that some events might need, like, well, we'll take that into consideration and implement them pretty quickly is just because the communication is just always there. Um, and a big part of that is just because, again, like Smash GG, the founding people and like now a lot of the new partner support guys, like we're all smashers ourselves. So we we already have like established relationships between like us, again, Smash GG and the people who run the events. So it's very easy for us to to one like get the feedback and also to understand their perspective and therefore we can like implement like awesome features for everyone to use how many people are working there 
Um, currently it's about like 17, 18, I think. Dang, that's actually, that's, that's a lot for like, just like, like I said, a focused startup. But, um, I think the smaller you keep your company and that, that does qualify as a relatively small software company. It lets you kind of be as nimble as you need to be, because as soon as you kind of like grow to a huge, um, scaling kind of thing, you have to worry about implementing new features that might affect other people and just like create a bunch of chaos across your platform. And I think one of my favorite things about Smash GG is like seeing, locals use it like seeing like 10 people like 10 person tournaments or just like really really small tournaments um because you'd think that that kind of platform like a, a powerful platform at least or one that like national level tos use you're gonna think oh man it's gonna be behind a paywall it's gonna be like inaccessible to the like normal people who use it it's like a lot of like business class software or um I'm thinking with like social analytics, like there, there are sites, there's only like two services that allow Snapchat analytics and one of them is $500 and that's the cheap one. It's like $500 <laughs> a month. And you're like, why isn't there like, you know, there are going to be people that are just like using it day to day or like just casually who are going to want to know statistics and stuff. So mm -hmm. why are you hiding it behind that giant wall? And, and like I said, seeing just like randoms, I guess I, I don't want to just like reduce them down to randoms, but <laughs> using like. T, you know, like people who are just like organizing things casually seeing them use it is just like it's pretty awesome yeah um so i think obviously like smash gg is a business and obviously we need to like like the company needs to sustain itself otherwise it oh, can't help anybody right um but the the ultimate goal of smash gg i think is to create an ecosystem where like esports or just gaming events can sustain themselves. So like our, our goal is to, to support the ecosystem as a whole. And a big part of that is just like the locals, you know, the, the people who just want to start up an event for their city, their high school, maybe yeah. um, like a, maybe bigger than that, small than that, but like that, that's really where it starts. And that's just as important as the big, big events like Big House and Genesis and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and I think, you know, Smash EG recognizes that and it, it makes sense to, to support those guys as well as the big guys. It also kind of has the side effect. And I don't mean for this to come off a little maliciously. It's more of it, it, it reinforces the monopoly, so to speak. It reinforces the comfort with the, the platform. And like if everyone's using it and you're using it from your locals, you're going to be happy to use it for your nationals. Like if you're going from like competing at a local to competing at a national, you're going to be comfortable using it. And then when they introduce features or, you know, crowdfunding or something like that, it's not so much of a big jump that you are going to be confused about signing up for a new platform. Like imagine, imagine all the, the compendium stuff. Imagine all the compendium stuff was on a separate site um, from the one that they signed up for, or they signed up for the tournament on. It's like, or if it wasn't integrated for fantasy or if it like it wasn't integrated all in one stop shop it's like the more things that you have to sign up for in order to get those like separate benefits or those separate like incentives the more people you're just going to like have drop off because they're lazy you know so just having it all in one spot makes so much sense in the sense that uh you're making it easy at least for people to participate in the side benefits as well as you know instead of just tracking tournament registrations yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a progression there, like you said, with the features, like there's the, the basic, like, you know, just like bracketing and registration. But um, I mean, yeah, I mean, monetizing your events is something that's the Smash community struggled with for a while. And like, I think before Smash EG came along, like people tried to do like Kickstarters and, you know, all, all GoFundMes and Patreons and whatever. It's just like it. Yeah. it it depends on the platform and then if you're if you're using just like a different one than the one that came before you it can be really confusing in terms of the like how the money gets distributed or how much people are taking a cut or whatever it's just like you, you have to unify the experience yeah bottom line is i think in integration just makes things easier overall so one stop shop man one stop shop you yeah, want to do that yeah, kind totally. of stuff kind of like shifting gears a little bit from the the business talk anyway i think we've shilled smash gg enough but the <laughs> uh the question I guess I have for you is as someone who's been a long time competitor in Smash, like in Smash Melee, how cool is it to like be employed by like, not just like, okay, you're, you're sponsored by a team and you're still kind of hustling to win tournaments in order to make money, but just like, Hey, you get a paycheck from a company that is working in Smash. How cool is that? Yeah, man. Um, I think you mentioned living the dream at some point and that it definitely feels like that sometimes because I mean, I've been playing Smash for what, like 10, 12 years. I, I use the number 10 years, but whenever I use that number, I realize it's, it's actually past that now. I think I'm at 11. Uh, but it was, 
I think up until very recently, not very cool to be a smasher and not profitable, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, it was a struggle. <laughs> it, it was de definitely a struggle. Like, I, I, I will never forget going to OC3, like my first tournament, uh, my, my first major. I flew down and, you know, I didn't have a hotel room. I just slept in a random room. Like, I, I remember just being super bothered that, like, I forgot my toothbrush and, like, I didn't brush my teeth. I didn't shower. I slept in a sleeping bag under the floor. Um, and, you know, it was just like this warehouse. 300 people there and there were like signs that said danger ammonia like that's Lovely. that's where we came from and the, the fact that like i can support myself and you know like like do an everyday job that is related to supporting the people that i grew up with um that that's a dream if if, if i've ever seen one you know and i mean it's just so weird like looking back like like you said it was up until recently it was very uncool to be a smasher or whatever but like i'm a doc kid i'm a, i'm someone that came in with the documentary the smash brothers in 2013 and like it's only been three years well i don't want to say it's only been three years but it's been three years since that and it's like if we looked back and like plotted a timeline of like months i guess and seeing just like how big tournament entries have gotten and how we're still working on the prize pools and we're still working on the prize pool cuts. That's something that has been uh, cropping up in the, the community's discussion a little bit. But mm -hmm. when you think about like the top players that are all sponsored now by like the major esports teams, um, that's some crazy progress for like three years. And then before that, like 2013, I think it was like, ten, was it 10 years? When, when did Melee came out, came or come out 2003? I have no idea. Let's look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, but just l l we all know that the game... Oh, 2001 even. So the game's over wow. 10 years... It was over at 10 years old at that point. And all of a sudden now it's kind of coming into this renaissance where like more people can be supported by it. And that's, that's just very nuts to me. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned like players and getting sponsors and, uh, sponsors and stuff. Like, I mean... Jason Zimmerman, Mewtwo King, being sponsored by Rick Fox of Echo Rick Fox. Rick Fox. Like, that's a sentence that I never thought I would ever hear. You yeah. know, like, <laughs> Jason Zimmerman, Mewtwo King, sponsored by ex-NBA LA Lakers player. Uh, three that's, time, that's some strange stuff. Three-time NBA ch uh, champion, I guess. Let's yeah. see. I think it's two or three. But what it's just like... And the only reason that happened is because Rick Fox's son was a CLG fan for League of Legends. So... Mm. that's how they connected was okay. League of Legends and the LCS and then Rick Fox is just like wait a second there's a, there's an industry here so he picks up a team and then that team sponsors Jason Zimmerman so it's just like there is a lot of different things like a lot of different interlocking parts there that um that just feel weird almost it just feels weird to see how far that's come yeah super um, weird super weird again like um where smashers in particular like we're not used to having very much like i still remember going to smash summit and like literally <laughs> smash summit yeah okay. get, getting getting a ride from this. our hotel to the venue that's uh that's foreign to me having a dr uh, having a fridge with drinks that are cold and just like oh you can you can have two cokes you know and that's okay uh that's that's strange I remember before the event, and I told Tafikins this last uh, episode, that I told Kevin, Pew Pew Pew, um, mm -hmm. I told him, this isn't going to be like any tournament that you've ever been to. Because I had been to the summit, which was um, BTS's um, Dota event beforehand. I, I was just like, this isn't going to be like any tournament that you've been to. This is probably going to be the most lucrative smash fest you've ever been to. Mm -hmm. Because in terms of just like, I had to be, warn him, I was just like, they're going to cater for you. You are going to have food every day. You are not going to have to pay for it. They're going to, you know, they're going to um, rent hotels for you. They are going to bus you back and forth from the hotels. Like they're going to pretty much make sure that you guys are comfortable in order to just play smash. And it seems like, like to some people, I guess it can seem like the celebrity treatment, but for other esports, it's just like, oh yeah, that's, that's totally, um, that's totally there. Or like that that's totally normal, I guess. So it was interesting from my perspective anyway, seeing the Smashers, mostly because everyone was so excited about it. And that's what like brought a huge smile to my face. I love when people are like I love that kind of transition from like um you were saying you're not used to all that stuff, but I like it when you're treated in a way that like other people think is normal and you're just like, Holy crap, like so good. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's one thing that I, I heard a lot is that Smashers, at least right now, are, are very low maintenance and uh, very grateful in general. And that's that's kind of like the result of us, again, like struggling through so much to get to where we are. Um, but uh, I, I actually had an interesting thought. Um, so I think um, 
for me, I, I think about this a lot and I think a lot of other people do as well, but just when, again, this isn't very big money to the, the rest of the esports communities, but like when, when Smash Summit, for example, first announced that like, oh, you know, they have like a 10,000 or $20,000 pop bonus with like, you know, compendium money as well. Like that was, that was such big money and that was so new to us that we were questioning like, like, is this like a scam? You know, like how, how does a... <laughs> is it a how, scam? <laughs> how does Smash Summit or how does a, sorry, BTS or Beyond the Summit, like how can they possibly justify running a four day event where they like fly out these players and like put all this money towards towards these players, right? Like how do they get that back? Um, but something that I've, I've realized recently is that like, man, like esports and, and Smash in particular, it's like really, really big. Um, and I'm not sure if this is the correct term, but in terms of like, content marketing um just because smash has or just reaches so many people in such like a, a large audience that's it's just part of like college culture and just you know people that i just knew from high school and just like random people that i met like everybody knows smash brothers the game and now i think a lot of those people end up knowing about the competitive scene so um i don't know i i think i've, I've kind of realized how big uh smash and just like esports in general is, is just how, how many people that actually reaches. And I mean, even though right now, like the, the prize pools and stuff don't really amount to the same amount as like League or Dota or some of the other giants, uh, I'm really hoping Smash keeps its momentum and keeps uh, getting the prize pools because I think, I think um, you know, we're, we're gonna have to keep growing otherwise the, the players and the content creators and all of those other people um, might not dedicate as much time and effort into sustaining the, the narrative and the community and stuff. And um, I don't know, it'd be a shame to to have the, the mo momentum that we have slow down. Is it kind of a, a moment where you're noticing players, like you were saying, um, you, you don't really think that players might take the reins in terms of creating content and that kind of stuff. Is that just more of they, they, they've never had to before and now you're, you're seeing some people just kind of have that light bulb click on their head and be like, oh, okay, I have this chance and if I want to sustain it, if I want to make myself as valuable as I can to my team so they don't dump me eventually, I actually got to start like doing all this stuff that I'd never really like thought was a big deal before. So yeah, I, I don't think that teams necessarily are super strict with their players in terms of content creation. Um, I think an example would be like West Falls. Like I don't think uh, Tempo Storm, uh, like their, their contract, you know, is very strict with him necessarily producing content like matchup analysis or just like random videos or anything like that. I think West Balls being West Balls is, is more than enough, so. Hmm. And we kind of like look at like, um, we kind of look at someone like Mango, um, who is, I, I don't want to say the only kind of major Smash streamer, but it's just like a lot of his kind of appeal or mass appeal anyway is coming not from him playing Smash, but from him like branching out into other games. And I think that's just like his initiative more than anything else. With, yeah, with, with Mango in particular, like, he can branch into other games and it'd be fine. Um, I think the main thing with Mango is that he's established himself as, like, a variety streamer, in a sense, where it's, it's more about him rather than the game that he actually oh, definitely. plays. Um, and I think a, a big part of that is that, like, you know, he's built a brand around himself. Like, one thing that he said is that, like, he kind of understands um, how that all works because, you know, he's an Eagles fan, right? Like, the Eagles to him is who he cheers for. It's, like, who he lives and dies for. And he at some point realized that he is the Eagles. Like, Mango is a team. All of his <laughs> subs, his, like, 3,200 and, what, like, 15 subs, like, they are all diehard Mango's fan or Mango fans, and it's, it's, it's because, like, you know, they, they all follow him. Like, he's the team. He carries that's, all of them on his back. That's, a good, that's, like, a good analogy in the sense that it's very important for people, like, uh, someone in his position to realize that because then you can take the analogy or you can take the experience of you being a diehard sports fan. You can be like, okay, what would I want the Eagles to do for me? Like, what would I want the Eagles to represent for me? What would make me feel betrayed by them or the organization? Um, how would I want to comfort them if I, if the Eagle, like how would I want to comfort Eagles fans if the Eagles failed? You know, like, <laughs> like say you guys, like the Eagles lost the Super Bowl. What as a fan would make you feel better from the Eagles organization or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it allows you to transfer, like a lot of esports and a lot of being successful at esports, I think is just transplanting experience from other industries or other kind of like outside experiences and just applying them through the lens of esports. And that's something that, like I said, with Mango, that's incredibly valuable because he is a rabbit. Like, the nation, the Mango Nation is not just 
like a group of fans it's you know it's like the Oakland Raiders or the Pittsburgh or like the Pittsburgh Steelers or like it's that kind of um tailgating environment where people are committed and people feel like they're a part of a fraternity or family or whatever and mm-hmm. for most people that is like the silver bullet in terms of being able to generate revenue from them in terms of being able to create loyalty and then use that loyalty for their advantage not in a nefarious way but just like in a business sense yeah um i i think uh <laughs> there are definitely a few people who have who have said the mango nation is like a cult almost like maybe in a different world mango could have been like a a great cult leader or maybe like cult is like kind of a, a negative connotation it has but, a know. negative cult connotation but it just implies that it's a very fanatical and a very loyal audience mango inspires others one way or another and i think um i think overwhelmingly it's positive um i, I think one thing that you said was um with content creators and you know people who are looking to support themselves in esports you know you would follow some of the modeling in uh in actual sports right so like with with esports events the main like piece of content just overall is like tournament footage like people fighting yep. against each other and that sort of thing but like what do people do in between um and i think that's 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 kind of a question that's still not really fully uh explored or answered because like i think a lot of like the players and the the content creators and the tos and you know everyone who's who's looking to, to sustain themselves in this industry is like still not really sure what to do in the in the meantime i think uh, some people have like a really good formula like mango for example is like the shiny example like he's made it as a twitch streamer like he's found his you know short hop laser so to speak his fundamentals in his content creation he's able to sustain uh, sustain himself and there are a few others um i think it's actually really funny that in smash the the really successful people i would say at least on streaming and just content creation again yeah um, mango is one obviously Alex19 is another, like, he has a huge, huge sub count. I think more than Armada and Leffen and a lot of the other guys. Hugs is another one. And yep. what's the commonality? The commonality is actually that they're just all really, really charismatic and entertaining. Um, Hugs has gone to the point where he literally has his own, like, ET show where he just, like, shoots the shit and talk about whatever. Yep. And I, I guess that's that's what makes money. Like, we, I guess we already know that, that talk shows and entertainment and... And that sort of thing is what really gets attention. And I don't know, I, I guess there's still a niche for the technical aspect of the game. I mean, we have Sports Center and we have analytics and, and, and stuff like that for actual sports. Um, I think it's a matter of time before that, that happens in Smash. And I guess like they already have that for like League of Legends and Dota and stuff, right? Yeah, it's also just a thing where I was thinking about it where you, the, a smasher in general, like a high-level smasher that is going to be visible enough for people to like want to be a fan of someone, their greatest asset is their approachability. Because even if it isn't true in person, and even if it's getting to a point now where there has to be a kind of a separation between you know, being able to walk up to them at a tournament and get an autograph or play a friendly or whatever, that's at least the illusion. You know, That's at least the... Um, the impetus for people to like become engaged with them is that they think that they're accessible and they think that they're regular people and mm. they come off very genuine because they haven't been conditioned by the esports environment to be like a- above or apart from the players they are still they are still players at heart mm-hmm. um so being able to foster that into a positive stream environment, that's not hard because you have the impetus, like you have the reason for people to check you out because Alex19, Hugs, Mango, whatever, it's like you see their antics either on social media or Twitter or, you know, through other lenses and then you're like, hmm, I wonder what that guy's like when he's just like streaming regularly. It doesn't matter what he's streaming, but it, as long as he keeps that facade up um, or like meeting that expectation that people have built up um, just from like secondary sources Mm -hmm. they just generate loyalty right something that i was very interested in and was going to write something about was the um the alex 19 mango lucky kind of trifecta there where Mm -hmm. they kind of promote each other they kind of host each other they kind of have like in jokes between the streams matching emotes that kind of stuff and it's like even though they are not formally on the same team or anything like that they still have the benefit of being like um a lot of cross promotion and that kind of stuff I mean, with, with those guys in particular, um, I think it's less about, like, formally being on the same team. Oh, totally. Uh, and more so just, like, you know, they, they basically grew up together. Like, a, a term that I like to use a lot is, like, uh, you know, I grew up learning the Falco Ditto. Like, that's how I, I learned the game. Um, in that respect, I think Mango, Alex19, and Lucky, like, they grew up learning the game together. So, I mean, they're essentially family, right? So, of course, they're going to the, help promote each other in that sense. 
it definitely like it doesn't hurt <laughs> let's put it that way like it definitely mm-hmm. doesn't hurt them um i i don't necessarily picture all three of them sitting around a boardroom and being like okay we're gonna schedule i'm gonna schedule you know i'm gonna stream from x hour to x hour and then i'm gonna host over to you and blah 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 mm-hmm. i don't really see anything as formal as that but like it helps all of them grow even if like it's very tempting to just like put players on tiers where it's like not only just in skill but in terms of their following it's like mm. any of the big five are going to be draws any like leffen is going to they're going to be draws in terms of whatever they do if they put out a youtube video if they stream or whatever there's a reasonable expectation that there's going to be at least some attention on them but then there's like it depends the uh, the lower you go i guess on the perceived skill ranking the more you kind of need an outside influence in terms of you know your, their entertainment factor or their personality or their approachability um in order to drive people there but if you're mango and you're gonna point to people to to lucky or alex 19 who otherwise wouldn't have seen them or if you're gonna have them on those your um your stream Mm -hmm. it kind of onboards people it's like i'm constantly thinking about this now and like how do you get people onboarded onto you and for those two guys you know alex and lucky towards mango mango is the onboarding process and that that can't hurt um yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I guess that's kind of true. Like, it definitely doesn't hurt that that uh, Mango, excuse me, is a, uh, you know, they're helping to to promote Alex and uh, and Lucky. But like, I think I think genuinely, like, they would have been fine on their own. Like, I have to give huge props oh, totally. to them. Um, and which actually brings up another thought for me. Um, I, at some point, I realized when when Melee and Smash was kind of getting bigger that like there were two metas going on. Actually, there's the there's the inside the game and the stuff going outside the game because it's like i think every player understands that you know they're, they're not going to be a player forever right like um you you can't just compete uh for you know the rest of your life because there are like physical limitations maybe the game will just like phase out another game will replace it like all these sort of things and i think a lot of these players recognize that and are playing the other game which is basically like you know there's how good can you get within melee and how well known can you get outside in order to transfer it later yeah i mean just like establishing a brand establishing a personality i think that's the typical route that a lot of like even in the sports industry you know that's what people do like when players retire like Shaq, you know he runs his businesses but he's also like an nba like analyst and commentator or whatever yeah and i think um you know that that's something that i've definitely thought about a lot myself um where like you know i i I don't know if people know this but like I, i quit my like it or like engineering job a couple years ago and I was trying to like figure out what I wanted to do within Smash and like I think maybe there could have been a better time but like I, I hit like a really good sweet spot where um, like I could quit my job and you know like two years later or, like a year later I now have a job within esports um, I'm so happy to say that like I'm one of the people that that like was able to like get a job within it and to sustain themselves like doing something that I really love um, and it's just like, you know, between like Lucky um, and Alex19 and all the players out there and the TOs out there and just anyone else looking to make it. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's really cool that people are, are able to do that now or, or starting to be able to find those opportunities. Yeah, finding the opportunities, but you also they have to take it seriously in the first place, which is always good. Like I'm, I'm very much a fan of when you can definitely see the moment or like kind of get an idea that a person has shifted from just being like, ah, okay, like I'll just kind of like ride by the seat of my pants and see how this goes Mm -hmm. to like, okay, I actually like want to make a thing out of this. Yeah, it's, it's hard, man. Like I think, I think especially right now, like a lot of people will have those days where it's like, I have so much motivation to like make a big change in the world or like, you know, I want to be like the best player or like the best commentator, but like it's, it's honestly like a grind. Like anyone who's like played an MMO or like a game where you just have to do the same thing over and over again to like kind of level up, like it's a grind. Like even like, you know, you look at Mango, like he's the best Twitch streamer, but like I don't think a lot of people realize like he grinded hours. Like he literally has to sit in front of a camera and entertain people for like eight hours a day. Um, and he does that like, you know, five, four full days a week on top of competing. Like it's, it's not easy, like you said. Yeah, it's definitely like it's I, I don't want to say it's the unseen like thing because everyone mentions that every, everyone mentions that it's, you, you know, it doesn't come immediately and it doesn't you're, you never get kind of famous overnight. But at the same time, I don't think people realize like um, they know it's coming, but they aren't prepared for it still because it still hits very hard, so to speak. 
Mm, yeah, for for the people who do find that opportunity, um, it'll it'll definitely hit hard. Uh, I think, I mean, there are, there are definitely a lot of people who like have a starting video or piece of thing that like goes really well and mm. you know some people write it and some people don't and like i feel like for me for example like i don't think cactuar and i like ever hit that one big piece of thing that went viral and like you know like that that gave us a lot of attention and then and then we rolled off of that and then you spiral you spiral out from there yeah hey i mean th- i'm still i'm still looking for that let's put it that way i'm still looking for that dude it's it's hard man like um Esports is esports as a whole is a startup. Like if you you know yeah. when you think a startup company, like the the fucking industry is is a startup. So like the opportunities are, it's are, are not really obvious. I think um, a yeah. lot of times you have to create your own opportunities. Like basically create something like a, a a desire or like a need for a product that no one else has thought of before. Um, mm. And I think that's why like you know the talent and the people who are at the top are succeeding so well it's because like they're they're the innovators but right now you know the 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 meta or just like the the average person who's like trying to to do well in esports like that's not really clearly defined yet and i think that's why it's still so hard for so many people it's it's funny because it's gotten harder it's gotten very it's gotten very difficult anyway in the sense that uh, i remember when it only took like 20 upvotes in order to get to the front page of our league of legends <laughs> and you look at it now it's like one of it's like top 10 traffic on reddit it's like unless you get x amount of upvotes in the first hour you are not making the front page you are not getting a decent amount of um you're not getting a decent amount of traffic off of that and then you're not building your brand unless it like click there's so many things that have to like click in the right way mm-hmm. and it's dumb to like think or blame it when it doesn't you just have to keep trying like i think I, we kind of went through this with the, at the score when i was there where we would put a, in a lot of effort into a certain piece and we'd be like oh man this is going to knock it out of the park and then it would just fizzle it would nothing would happen with it and you have to have the resiliency to just be like all right it didn't work this time just gonna try again next time and just maybe that one will do it it's just like we're just calling a lot of favors let's put it that way sometimes <laughs> you have to just be like hey can you just like i i hate to bum a retweet but can you do that for me please oh yeah i mean um, um that i think that's that's just like content creation oh my god like i i don't know how you do it how you put out article after article and like i, I don't know like when when me and cactuar worked on putting videos together like I think a lot of people like they just see like oh here's like the finished product like oh I like that or like you know that that was cool or whatever but for us like we spent so much time just like working on maybe a single thing or a single detail and just worrying about like oh should we press that upload button or like how how is this going to do how's that going to do what should we do as our next thing and I think at least for us ultimately that led to us kind of like not being able to sustain ourselves just because we like question ourselves i think it also comes back to that like um you know you have to for for content creation you have to find your 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 short hop laser your your fundamentals like you have to find that thing that really really works stick with it and expand from there we never found that thing and i think that's the the struggle that a lot of content creators are still um kind of struggling with Hmm. something i kind of wanted to shift gears a little bit mostly just because i i wanted to kind of devote the last little bit of this episode towards that period that you were talking about when you quit your job mm. and pre pre smash gg post job quitting because like i it was interesting like we didn't really start talking I, I don't remember when we started talking but um it was interesting observing you because like i usually try to like get a feel for people who are going through similar journeys as myself and um i guess that may that might sound a little narcissistic but at the same time it's like um you're you're hoping that you can learn from them as well or Mm -hmm. you can understand like if they eventually make it you want to try to decept like uh you want to try to figure out what they did or what was special about them so it was interesting in your case where it was like i got the feeling that you were very much like okay well we got to make this work like this it was like full dedication mode being like okay we've got to like just throw out a whole bunch of stuff, see what sticks. And it's just like, um, kind of getting over that like hesitancy to press the upload button, I guess. So man, whenever I think back about like kind of my last couple years, so like the TLDR is like, you know, I quit my job. I did a bunch of stuff and then I got a job. Right. But like my, my mentality at the time when I quit my job, like I didn't really have a plan. Um, I remember, uh, (laughs) definitely, um, like, you know, a few people ask me, like, in Skype calls or just whatever, like, 
you know, like, what are your plans for the next six months? Like, how are you going to support yourself? Like, do you have a monetization plan for Smash or Smash practice? And I'm like, no, not really. We were just going to, like, you know, kind of wing it and just, like, you know, focus on the content or, like, you know, focus on doing well. But, like, I think if I had to redo it, the biggest piece of advice, and I've said this a bunch of times already, is just, like, have a monetization plan. I think that's actually the most important thing. Like, literally, if you're not really sure what to do, just come up with a play to maximize the amount of money that you have. Because at least that gives you resources and that gives you like uh, positive reinforcement for the work that you do. And that way, um, once you once you are able to sustain yourself, you can continue to grow. Like that's just the basis of the beginning of any type of career path, right? Um, did, oh, so I, I guess... No, uh, no, no, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, did you ever... like a, the, a common worry that some people like that have is like, they worry that they're selling out too quickly or like I can imagine that someone in that situation it's like you're thinking about okay like how do I monetize that and like to the, to the best of my ability I can imagine someone who's like trying to just like figure out what kind of content they want to do thinking oh like I don't want to think about money right now you know or I don't want to think about or have money be the like primary focus of it I think um I think if money is not working out for you, I think that's something that you should focus on. Um, there was a, a, an article, I think on Red Bull, I, I forgot where, but, um, or maybe it was like a, no, I think it was a Melee at Omni article that Papa Paint did, where he talks about monetization and how that's like, kind of like a demonic word, especially for the Smash community, because like, we're not used to seeing money, but like, you know, like, love for the game dies very quickly when you can't like feed yourself, when you can't sustain yourself, right? And you know, that like quality requires resources and resources require money. And like, I guess I don't have like an analogy or a rule where like, oh, this is something that's selling out and this is something that's not. But at the end of the day, if people enjoy your content and if people wanna have more of that content, you need to support the content creator. That's just a fact. And um, truthfully, like I, I don't know if I can say if that's up to the uh, the consumer or if it's up to the content creator to make that work. I think it's more slightly more toward the content creator. Um, but um, you know, like the, just just the money money is important. And for me and Cactuar in Smash practice, like we didn't think about that. And I think that's mm. the main reason why we crashed and burned. It's such a weird thing where it's like you. As a creator, you can get very insecure about that kind of thing. And this is partially me speaking from experience where you're thinking, well, if I try to like figure out a way or like give people a way to um, support me, it's almost like you're thinking that you're so important that you're worth being paid for. And like, it's such a weird, um, I don't want to say an inadequacy thing, but it's like, especially when you're starting out, you're just like, oh man, am I worth like you know, doing a Patreon or am I worth like trying to crowdfund something or if I, am I worth like asking for donations and stuff like that? It's almost like as a creator, we are um, conditioning ourselves or some people might condition themselves into thinking that asking for that kind of support is just an inconvenience. And if they do, that's going to drive people away from them. That's that's an actually really interesting point. Um, I don't know if I spent too much time thinking about that, but I, I my thoughts on that right now are if if you know your craft is content creation if that's what you want to do for a living like the reality is that you need to be able to make a real salary off of it and you know if you don't have the confidence to to really think that you know your content is worth some sort of like real monetary value then maybe content creation isn't for you and obviously like you have to be very tactful about the way that you go about <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> you can't just be that direct yeah you can't just like oh you know say like oh like fucking just donate to me if you want to keep you know you have yeah, to exactly. provide incentives and be smart about it obviously so. well you can't you can't hold people hostage and you also can't come off as um resentful of people who don't but at the same time you have to make it clear that you know you are a real person with with needs it's such just like a weird social dynamic that not a lot of people or well not everyone can grasp and at the same time you have to be able to grasp that and then do all the content generation thing on the other, like there's so many different facets of it because you have to be your own business person you have to be your own PR you have to be your own marketing and you have to be your own complete studio so it's like that's probably the most interesting thing for me with esports and why partially why I started this pro this uh, podcast was there are so many people who are taking on all those different roles who have had no prior training 
in terms of formal training or in terms of just like interning or anything like that. And they're just trying to make it work. So mm. if I guess I, uh, you know, one of the last questions I had for you was like, how did you like kind of deal with those rougher days where <laughs> you were thinking, man, maybe leaving that job was a mistake? Oh my God. Oh my God. I, I don't know <laughs> if I really, I don't know if I have any good advice for that, honestly. Like looking back, um, I mean, me getting my job right now is kind of like a perfect storm where a lot of the things that I kind of just did over that year, even though none of it was very like, you know, none, none of it was really engineered towards getting this specific job. Like it just happened to work out. And yeah, I mean, I definitely had some days where like, I can't say that I had depression, but I definitely can say that like I felt depressed a lot of the times um, where I would had like, you know, just mornings where I couldn't get out of the bed and you know, I would just have like a vortex of like negative thoughts. Um, I mean, really, I guess what it is, is just like eye on the prize or eye, eye on the prize. Is that the, is that the term? I don't know, but just like, Oh yeah, totally. It's just like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you have to embrace the long term goal and realize that it's all part of the journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, just like, I, I just had to remind myself, like, you know, why is it I, I left my job in the first place and like why I wanted to, to pursue this thing. It's, it's because I, I love esports i love the, the the people that are part of it i love the game i love you know um just all the like working with all the people that that i kind of grew up with and you know that's the thing that i want to spend like at least right now just like the foreseeable future doing and you know no no good things uh come without some sort of risk otherwise someone else would have just done it, right? Yeah, everyone would have done it. Yeah, know. it's just like supply and demand. And like, you know, if, if you're if you're shooting high, you're going to have some tough days. And I guess maybe just remind yourself, um, you know, why you did in the first place. <laughs> and I guess uh, that's a really good thing to end off with. But I, I just wanted to ask, <laughs> do you miss do you miss poor zoo being part of your identity, so to speak? Like not necessarily the poor as oh, unfortunate, but poor as in the literal like, um, I don't know. I think you kind of like took that joke and ran with it in stride where you were just saying like, oh, like I'm, you know, unemployed, whatever, <laughs> poor, poor zoo. So do you, do you kind of miss that being able to like joke about that? Um, it, it's, it's definitely a good joke. Um, the, the actual follow up to that is, uh, I am now GG zoo, which has a very You're similar GG meaning. Zoo. <laughs> so like whenever, yes. whenever I've actually seen this in streams where like, I think in my last match against Bladewise, in loser's bracket of a, a Washington tournament called Emerald City. He pulled three stitch faces, and I'm pretty sure the chat was just all <laughs> spamming GG. Uh, not, you know, it's Smash GG, but it's also GG. Zoo. Like, good game. Good yeah. fucking game. <laughs> um, I actually do want to say one thing. Uh, yeah. Jokes aside, you know, me being poor Zoo and me being, like, financially whatever, um, I definitely do not encourage anybody to um, just quit their job and oh, yeah. you know, only have, like, a certain, like really really plan out your finances out in advance like i i had saved up a decent amount of money just from living frugally and you know just just by i also had like a pretty nice job before so like you know i just i you know i i planned out my time and i had like it, it a was certain, feasible hmm? you weren't dumb about it no no i set a timeline i i knew like this is the amount of time that i had before uh you know i ran out of savings and like before like i have to look into other jobs um so yeah, be responsible guys. Uh, you know, it's, it's also kind of like a paradox because like, although I don't know that I can necessarily recommend people to just quit their jobs and go full-time esports, like that's a, that's a common thing that people like to say that like, oh, you know, you should not like quit your job um, and to pursue like esports or something else unless you have some sort of like reliable lead. Backup, yeah. Um, but I honestly don't know if I would be where I am today if I didn't do that. So like, I, I, I'm never sure what to tell people when people ask me about that. So that's, I don't know, just another interesting thought. It's it's a thing that I kind of went through as well, where as soon, I, I eventually, I used to work at a software company and then I quit in order to freelance full time. And part, part of that was to do more esports stuff. But um, I always tell people, take whatever money you think you need to generate per month or per week and double it because you were going to have to run into things like um, invoices taking way too long or bureaucracy or just like conversion rates messing you up in terms of like, you know, uh, for Canadians, like we have to worry about the U.S. exchange rate. Hmm. Um, just like anything 
that you think is your plan, you have to just like go above and beyond. And then if you can meet that, then sure, maybe. Like I I get totally what you're saying in terms of the weirdness of recommending people because it's like you, it's very hard to convince people that they can do it when they have like a full-time job or something like that. But at the same time, it's like you can't start from nothing and then go straight Mm full-time because you almost need to have the experience of trying to grind for it um, while you're working full-time at something or while you're involved with something that takes a lot of your time because if you're really kind of committed to it and you really want to do it, you kind of prove to yourself in the process because you are willing to, like, work a 9 to 5 and then work a 6 to, like, 2 a.m. on this thing, right? It's like you can't just go cold turkey and just be like decide, oh, next week I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to like start writing about esports. It's like, no, if you were if you really wanted to do it, you would maintain your full time job for your sense of stability and safety. And then once you got to a point where you couldn't advance anymore without quitting your job, then that's kind of like the safety thing. It's like kids who say that they want to drop out of college or like not go to college in order to like be an esports writer. I'm just like, no, don't do it. It's a trap. It's just like I went to journalism school. I have a degree in journalism and it's still really rough for me. So like you, ah, man, the the thing is, is that so many people are seeing that, um, that success story. They're seeing the end of it. They're seeing the end success and they think that it's very easy to get to because they only see certain parts, uh, usually the highlights of the journey that it took to get here. Mm-hmm. They don't see like those days, like you said, that you don't want to get out of bed, but you kind of have to, because if you don't, you are you know, you're either ruining your progress or like you aren't trying at all. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like, it's a very weird industry to get into. That's why I always tell people it's a really screwy industry, but there, when you do have those good moments, they are very good. Yeah. I mean, again, I think esports uh, is, is a startup in a sense. And like, what, what do uh, startup companies, like who, who do they try to hire? Right? Like they, they hire people who fill a very specific need and unfortunately those needs are kind of like hyper specific and sometimes like very wonky where only like a very specific individual will like you know match what a company is looking for but you know right now like esports is still growing and you know the the scope of what that is continues to expand so um i don't know i have hope for the industry and i have hope for my friends who are also looking for these type of things so i don't know for the people who are still on that grind um I encourage there you, for to, you to keep it. I, I don't think that um, esports and, and Smash in particular is, is going downhill right now or anything like that. So um, keep it up. Uh, I want to see you guys there. <laughs> Definitely. I think that's a great place to end on. Thank you so much, Julian, for taking the time to uh, visit with us tonight. Where can people find you on the internet? Um, well, uh, my Twitter is still poor Zoo. And uh, I think there's know, an underscore Zoo in there, Falco though. and uh, have some fun. <laughs> I think there's a. There's a underscore. It's like P O R underscore Z H U. You know, I, I learned I learned marketing, uh, and ah. I realized that underscore serves no purpose and only adds confusion. <laughs> it is now just poor zoo, one word. Damn, you got the uh, you got the all one word. Yeah, I know, I did. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Normally, when people switch from like, uh, I think a lot of esports people now are starting to um, get in with organizations who know Twitter, so they can free up the elusive. Um, like the accounts that they want. So whenever someone gets like first name, last name, or whenever someone just gets like just their handle, I'm like, oh mm. man, that's that's some serious business right there. Anyways, thank you guys so much for checking out this episode of Sessions. It was really fun to uh, talk with Zoo about, you know, esports as a startup and trying to nail your initial short hop lasers. <laughs> um, we will be back next week with another episode. Until then, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube or Twitch, um, don't hesitate to give us a follow or a subscribe. If you're listening to this on audio, thank you so much for checking out the podcast. You can uh, find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you want to learn how to subscribe to any of those, you can go to sessionscast.com slash subscribe which is really hard to say without lisping or spitting into the microphone. But otherwise, all the other details are on sessionscast.com. My name is Matt Demers. Again, thank you for listening. I will see you guys later.